we're going to switch over to talking about really everybody else in society, not so much the young, not so much the old, but really everybody else, right? And the effects of the lockdown, how it's impacted society, business, life, all of that. My colleague, Dr. Erickson. All right. Well, um, yeah, excited to be here. I'm from California. A lot of us from California right now. And uh, I met Simone, uh, interestingly enough, she found me. I had done a little, little bit of a press release back in, oh, this is early April, and uh, kind of just gave a raw data dump. And uh, people liked it and didn't like it, as you can imagine. It wasn't biostatistically analyzed. It was basic raw data that I said, okay, this is what I found. We had done 5,000 tests, 6.5% positive, and I was just dumping raw data. I wasn't saying, you know, all of society. I was just giving my opinion on it because I, I had seen so much uh, fear. And uh, patients were saying, you know, what, what do we believe? What do we not believe? The, the media was asking us, you know, can you give us some feedback on what you're seeing? Because I have several we have clinics all throughout California. So they said, can you give us some semblance of, you know, should we be terrified? Should we be staying in our homes? And I said, well, the disease I'm seeing is mild. I said, we're seeing thousands of patients with some congestion, cough. We follow them for two weeks. They get better with no treatment, and they go right back to work. And they said, well, that's not what we're seeing in the media. I said, well, I'm on the front lines, the front line doctors. We're seeing these, and this is what we're seeing. This is not hyperbole. This isn't why I think. This is what we're seeing. Young and old, we're seeing them do quite well. They're going back to work. They're going back to school. They're not staying at home. They're not terribly ill. So I, I felt like I had to do some type of a press release. So my press release was supposed to be a, a five-minute nightly news thing, and they told me about something called Facebook Live. And that baby went everywhere. And so I, what the, the main advantage of it was I got to talk to doctors from all over the country. And I said, hey, Ohio, New York, what are you guys seeing? ER doctors, what are you seeing? And they said, well, we're seeing what you're seeing. They said, except patients aren't coming in. And I said, well, you know, explain that to me. They said, well, it was a, it was a, it was a Saturday. He said, I, a guy with chest pain on Tuesday didn't come in till Saturday. He had had a mild heart attack, had some damage, didn't come in because he was afraid of COVID. Next patient, abdominal pain, uh, diverticulitis that had perforated. Well, why didn't you come in a week ago? I was afraid of COVID. So they're afraid of the COVID, so the care they should have received is delayed. And so I, I felt the, the responsibility to get out there and start talking about this, get a dialogue going with those of us that are actually seeing patients, you know, not media types. So uh, that's, anyway, that's a the, that's the long, a long introduction. But Dr. Gold, uh, that's how I met her. She found me and we kind of, you know, felt this bond over needing to do something. You know, we love this country. Dr. Gold, if you know her at all, she is passionate about the country, about our constitution, about our rights, about our amendments. She's a fireball on these topics, and she's the reason we're all, she's kind of like the, the center of the, the wheel. She's the reason why we're here. So I, I've enjoyed getting to know her over the last three months. Uh, she inspires she has inspired me to, to speak out more. And, uh, and I, I kind of wanted to say one thing before I get started is that, you know, before I took a Hippocratic Oath, I took a pledge. Um, I pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't know if you guys took that pledge, but most of us in school put our hand over our heart and did that daily. And we faced the flag, and our teachers faced the flag. We didn't burn it. We didn't stomp on it. We faced it, and we respected it. And that's the background I believe we're all coming from, is respect for country, respect for flag. Allegiance. I pledge loyalty. I pledge commitment to the flag that represents our 50 states. I pledge to help keep it together and unite the people to the republic for which it stands. What's a republic? It's a, a state in which the supreme power rests with the people and our elected officials. You know, the republic for which it stands. Our republic right now is being attacked. COVID is just a vehicle to attack the republic. As I, I walk around DC and I see empty streets, I see a hotel that's 8% occupied. That's a tragedy. That's the republic under attack. Make no mistake, that's not COVID. That's the republic under attack. 
when I see hospitals, I call the CEOs I, this week. I said, how's it going? What percent of your hospital is COVID? 15. So 85, 90% of the healthcare is things like cardiac disease, diabetes, you know, all kinds of fractures. We've forgotten that the medical system is this huge thing. We're all COVID crazy, all about COVID, and we focused on the one thing to the detriment of others. So anyway, that's just kind of an introduction of where, how I met her, where we're coming from. We love, I think we all love this country and this room, and we're here to try and get the republic back on its feet. Uh, a couple things, our early testing, we have eight medical centers throughout the state of California. Our early testing showed about 6.5% positivity. We've done 5,000 tests. To date, we've done 26,893 tests. These are your PCR nasal swabs. So we're, we're, we keep three labs busy. I don't know if you guys are doing this testing, but the fear has driven massive traffic. We had a June like I've never seen. I, I went to one of our centers and I thought it was the DMV. <laughs> Packed in, people around the building. I was like looking for free puppies and hot dogs. I thought, what, what, what is going on? No, it's fear. As we've heard from most of our esteemed people today, driving that. So um, our, our test to date right now, uh, most currently as of last week, were 14.9% positive PCR for 26,893 tests. Again, most people very, uh, very mild illness. And what I was noticing on the media is that they were saying cases, 5,000 new cases in Houston. Okay, a case is a person healthy that tested positive, the vast majority. But the public hears cases and thinks, oh my goodness, these are sick people. No, the vast majority, 99.8% of people get through this with little to no progressive or significant disease. But the cases, every day, all the major media, the cases, the cases, the cases, that is not what we should be talking about. Hospitalizations, that's fair. D deaths that are appropriately coded on a death certificate, that's fair. And I, I stress appropriately coded. Um, our testing has been taking about seven to ten days and this has been the challenge where you're telling people to isolate for 10 to 14 and you're, they're getting their test results right at the end of their sort of quarantine. So I don't know what you guys think of quarantine. Uh, from the very beginning I've questioned quarantine. The word quarantine. We quarantine those that have had a significant exposure to something. Those are at significant risk. And this is the first time uh, I've seen quarantining healthy. I don't know if you guys think that's normal. I find that very strange. Um, initially, my family, uh, when we first started out in March, we were wearing masks, we were buying Lysol, we were doing the whole thing, right? And uh, then after a couple months, when I said, now wait a second, the cases I'm seeing are extremely mild. I called the CEOs from three different centers in Central California, I said, how are you guys doing? Slow. I said, like how slow? 40% occupancy. Whoa. And they had all their, the tents are out. We're ready for bear and squirrel shows up. We were ready, right? We were, we were going for the big ones. We were all ready because we had heard, we'd watched China, we'd watched the different nations and said, let's get ready for this, which I agree with 100%. Let's get fully ready, but then let's be realistic with the response. Who showed up? Most of the patients that were showing up for me were very mild illness. So at that point, we need to make sure, that's why I, I wanted to come out and sort of give reality to the situation on the ground and, and sort of help dispel some fear that people have had. Um, what else here? The academic models, I forgot to mention those. I, I'm sure you guys heard the early academic models, two and a half million cases. Some of the predictions out of Europe made their way over here. That caused pandemonium, oh my goodness. Millions of cases, and our, our leaders, uh, unmentioned named leaders, were, were telling us this. And that created some fear amongst physicians in my practice. We have about 50 people in my practice. That caused some fear, because our leaders were telling, early, early on now. And so as I had done so much testing, I, I felt the need to come out and sort of talk about what I was seeing, and not just what I was hearing on the media, which was the opposite of what I was, was seeing. Uh, Simone asked me to talk about lockdowns because it's, it's an interest of mine. Uh, I've sort of uh, studied the globe a little bit to see, are, were we the best, uh, was our ideology the best? Did we produce a good result 
uh, from the lockdowns. I don't, I don't know if you guys thought we did, but when you, when you take on a $21 trillion economy, maybe I'm crazy, I think you need science and data. So I, I looked around the world to different people and I said, what is the science and data of social distancing, locking us down, where's the science for that? And it was crickets. And I looked for it, maybe you guys found it, I couldn't find it. And I heard from the epidemiologists globally that it's not about science, it's about how, how you want to handle this as a community. And we handled it based on what we thought was the best maneuver, which was kind of to shut down an economy. But I thought, there's going to be so much collateral damage to this. When you're taking a massive economy, which we've never done, the United States, if you study GDP, is the largest economy in the world. There's not a close second, right? And so if you're going to experiment with that, you, you better know you're going to be right. And I don't think we knew that. And so we moved forward shutting down the economy. What do we hope to accomplish? They said, we're going to flatten this curve. And I asked Dr. Vitowski, uh, who is a biostatistician, I asked several epidemiologists, what do you think of this whole flattening curve? Where we, instead of spiking up, spiking down, getting through it, i.e. China, if you look at the graphs of how they went and getting through it, let's, let's go ahead and slow the spread. Let's, let's spread people out, let's mask them up, and let's slow this thing down. Did you guys think that was a good idea? I, I'm asking you guys, did, did you guys think that was a good idea? I mean, does anybody think that's a good idea? It seems like a good idea at the beginning. It sounds good to protect the hospitals. So at some point we thought, okay, we see, we see uh, Italy, we see Spain, 600 deaths per million, all these people flowing in. Was the footage all realistic? We can debate that, right? But I, I think the key thing is that um, we didn't really know what it was going to, if flattening the curve was going to work for the hospitals. So after we did that, we said, let's spread people out. Fine, I did the same thing. Mask at home, lights all everywhere. We're cleaning, we're slowing it down. Now the hospitals are dead. And my brother-in-law, orthopedic surgeon, calls me and he goes, um, they just told me I'm non-essential. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I had a hip scheduled Tuesday and they told me I can't do it or else I'll lose my license. Wow, Texas, what is going on? So <laughs> he, he, had to, he did one case um, into the, into the whole COVID crisis, and now he's being reviewed by the medical board, an orthopedic surgeon, for replacing a hip so someone could walk and not get a pulmonary embolism. Does anybody think that's non-essential? So this, this, is, this is some of the craziness, and, and I, I, uh, I had to speak out about it. Um, was the lockdown successful? I say yes, very successful. Successful in things like this. Anxiety hotline calls up 1,000%. Child abuse, both sexual and non, up. Uh, financial, emotional distress, suicide, alcohol, 150,000 Americans a month not receiving cancer screening. It's been effective, all right, in all the wrong metrics, in all the areas we didn't want it to be effective. Uh, delayed in medical care, we talked about that. Uh, orthopedics, non-essential, suicide calls up 600% suicide calls. And we've heard other doctors mention this. So was the lockdown effective? If, if that's what the effect you were going for, then yes, but it, it was trying to flatten the curve, but it had these, these secondary consequences that I think are devastating. Uh, people staying indoors, no exercising, as you mentioned, no vitamin D. Uh, people, I'm watching people in their Prius by themselves driving with a mask on. I mean, this stuff is, you know, there's no sense to it. It's fear, as one of the doctors pointed out. Uh, oh, uh, one other interesting thing I found is staffing. I don't know if you guys had this problem. My staff was getting afraid. They didn't want to come in. So we'd have six or seven people call off. We had one clinic that was doing all the testing. And they said, I don't want to be around the COVID. So our staff wouldn't come in. Now we couldn't see the patients, couldn't process. And if you know, if you guys did the, uh, the public health reporting is a little bit onerous, right? It's, I don't know if you guys follow all the paperwork for this thing. It's a lot. I, I hired 20 some people to just do paperwork and talk to the public health department, except to report every single case. So it was very, uh, it was very labor intensive. And what's interesting is, uh, I called the hospitals last week, I said, are you at capacity? And they said, well, we're at capacity for the staff we can get. We're not at capacity for the building, we only have certain ICU nurses, which we're paying triple what we normally pay, 130 some an hour for an ICU nurse, because there wasn't staff, because of fear. 
They didn't want to come in. They didn't, they didn't want to be around that deadly virus. You, you see how that perception has caused outflow into society? It's affected the hospitals. It's affected all of us. That fear is critical. I appreciate, I forgot the doctor earlier, the child psychologist, what, a, what an eloquent fear discussion he had. Perfect, perfect. First pandemic in the world, by the way, where we had social media, cameras, phones to share, panic can go around the world quick. If this happened in the, in the 80s, you know, we'd see it in the paper, you might, you might turn on Ted Koppel, but you, now you got on your phone live feeds from China. So the, I think all this, all this together sort of whipped up this global frenzy um, to where we could see things in real time as it was happening. We thought, well, that's not going to happen to us. We're going to lock down. We're going to stop this thing. Did it work? Did it slow the spread? We'll go over that in a little bit. Um, what else? Financial aspects of the lockdown. California is at 16.3% unemployment. That's terrible. What does that compare to? A uh, Great Depression, recession, whatever you call it, 2008 to 2010, we hit 12.3. This is worse than that. So unbelievable. Uh, $56 billion shortfall this year in California. $56 billion. And you know what our, our leadership and all their wisdom decides to do? Why don't we cut the funding for Medi-Cal? Prop 56 is, as you guys know, is a smoker's excise tax, $1.2 billion. It comes to people like me. I build centers in underserved areas so that the people, which is one in three people in California, they can get coverage. They can, they can get care in their neighborhood. They don't have to drive a half an hour. So by, by getting rid of that, that uh, pool of money, it's $1.2 billion. It's a smoker's tax for doctors to care for Medi-Cal. To take that care away from Medi-Cal and essentially slap our underserved with decreased health care to me is criminal. And, and I watch these decisions because um, I I'm, I'm talk to some of the congressmen. They say, can you believe we're voting on whether or not we should give medical care to our underserved Medi-Cal population, which is one in three in California? Can you believe this is happening? Because of a shortfall, because our hotel over here is 8% occupied. The taxes aren't flowing in D.C. or California. You, you can't do this, is what I'm saying, and not have significant medical you know, collateral damage. I'm going to suggest the collateral damage is far worse than COVID when you look at all the All factors combined, the delayed care, the uh, Medi-Cal not getting served, it's, it, you don't have to be a Ph.D. in economics to understand this is not good from a, a fiscal or a medical perspective. Okay. Um, 20 million Americans are still have lost their jobs. 40 million initially, we still have 20 million out of work. So these lockdowns have caused, and that, you know, we can go on for another 10 minutes on what that causes in society. And I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up Sweden. Um, I've been studying Sweden, watching them for four months now. Dr. Anders Tegnell, Dr. Johan Gosecki, um, they have sort of taken a different approach. Uh, I don't know if you guys have followed Sweden at all, but it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating because they trust their people. They said, you know, uh, we have a pandemic here. We know kids don't transfer it to adults. Let's keep the kids in schools, kids under 16. You know, uh, I, think, I think you would like, Dr. Hamilton would like the Swedish model. Kids under 16, all in school. Great, perfect. They didn't shut them down. Restaurants open. They told the citizens, hey, why don't you spread out a little bit? Uh, do what you do, and they listen to their government, they have a trusting relationship, and they're 460 uh, deaths per million. UK is part of the 600 club, 600 deaths per million. Spain, 600 deaths per, per million. They're all in the 600 range, total lockdown. Sweden is at 560, no lockdown. And then people say, okay, what about its Nordic neighbor? Has way less death. Right, so Norway has half the population, has much smaller uh, nursing homes, much less death. The, 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 I would say the mistake Sweden made was they didn't protect their elderly. They had these large elderly homes. They didn't protect their elderly. And Anders Tegnell will tell you that. He's their chief epidemiologist, brilliant guy. He's very content with their results, but he said one thing when pressed, what would I do different? He said, I would have protected our elderly. We didn't do that. And there's, there's multiple accounts of nurses and paramedics who said, we actually were keeping the elderly in their home. We didn't want to take them to the hospitals and infect the hospital. That caused some death. Delayed care. As you guys know, COVID is an early disease treatment. You've got to treat that puppy early. And if you wait, you start getting the respiratory, you start getting the inflammation, all that starts happening. Well, that's 
kind of the method they took. So that's one thing they would have done different. What I like about um, Sweden's model is it's sustainable. They said, listen, we can go on like this for years. You guys are in an unsustainable economic financial lockdown that cannot work. We are in a model we can go on for years. I think that's critical, a sustainable model that you can use when a pandemic comes. Because guess what? We're going to have corona and flu next year. Are we going to do this again? I, I pray not. I, I, I hope we can look at other countries and, and not be arrogant and say, I think they had a good result. Their, their kids are in school. Their shopping centers are open. Their restaurants are open. They're doing well. And they, they pulled back a little bit. You know, if, if, if 100 is the goal, they might, might have pulled back to 70. They didn't pull back to 10. We pulled it way down to an unsustainable level. Um, let's see here. Uh, I want to talk about uh, death totals. I'd written this down. In 1993, 97,000 Swedes died in total. This is one of the more deadly years. So what, is that, what does that look like monthly? Well, in December 1993, they had 11,000 deaths. This is a bad year. In April 2020, Sweden had 10,058 deaths. So this COVID pandemic coming through is not as bad as the year they had in 1993. So I, I always put everything in perspective when someone gives me a number. I go, what's, what's normal for that country? Is that, is that high? Is that low? It turns out that's on the higher end. Um, and we talked about the world deaths, the 600 club, UK, Spain, and Italy, all in the 600 range. UA, USA is at 448. Um, Sweden's at 564. These are deaths per million. So those numbers are just to show us that lockdown didn't produce a significant decrease in the death rate. Flattened the curve, didn't change the death rate that much. So I would say that locking down isn't a significant protective measure for deaths. And because we had, we had pockets that were overwhelmed, New York, New Jersey, I understand that. But in, in states like California, where I'm from, we absolutely weren't overwhelmed. We were underwhelmed to the point where hospital CEOs said, if we didn't have a massive chain of 10 hospitals, we would be closing our doors for good. So I don't think that's the right approach. Um, right now in Sweden, they have about 25% immunity. So an, another uh, benefit you get from people mingling is immunity. Is it herd immunity? No. That usually comes, per my epidemiologist, biostatistic friends, is usually 70% or greater. To where the young and healthy get the disease, and then it, the virus pretty soon runs out of places to go and kind of dies out. Sweden is on their way. Well, if you look at Norway, it's 1% to 2%. So you say to yourself, okay, non-lockdown, we got higher immunity, the economy's intact, you have some more deaths, which you know, uh, Norway may have later. As their people are not immune, they go into a cold and flu, no immunity, no protection, the disease goes. So I, I think Sweden's approach is better from that perspective. Uh, let's see here. So solutions. One of the solutions that I think we should talk about is uh, physician committees. I think having a, a group like this who advises our, our president and our leaders to say, this is what we're seeing. We're not, we're not, we're not theory people. We're not academic. I, I'm not using academic models. I assume most of you are using real, real world experience. I, I think people like us should have a little bit of say to say, this is what we're seeing. Why don't we take a rational approach? Why don't we have many, many wise counselors? Instead of kind of a single, maybe research-oriented person, why don't we get real-world people on the ground to give our input? And I think Dr. Gold has been, done a great job assembling you guys. Uh, measures in place to not shut down the economy, but take a sustainable approach. So I think Sweden, we have something to learn from them, as does the World Health, Health Organization, as you guys know, said we need to learn some things from Sweden. So I think those two things are critical, just to kind of finish up, is that we listen to our physicians on the front lines, we put measures in place to not lock down, and we, do a, we have a sustainable approach so that when we approach these pandemics, we're not merely struck by fear and confusion and academic modeling, we take an organized approach, we back down things a little bit, and we have a sustainable model to move through the next cold and flu season. So that's all I have. Thank you.